stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we have got one of the strongest men that ever walked on God's green earth. The first American to clean and press 500 pounds. His Olympic lifts certified in competition 1972 still stand as the American record today. He was in the first world's strongest man, Pan Am gold medalist. One of the greatest icons in wrestling history, one of the greatest figures. He is Mr. Ken Patera. Ken, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, JBL. Where, where's that Gerald Briscoe at? Hiding under the table? Here I, I am, Kenny, yes. man. I, it's a pleasure to see you today. You can't see my smiling face here. I mean, I'm, yeah. a, I'm, I'm the most handsome one on this on this monitor, for me well, at least. I have to admit that's true. That uh, you, you never <laughs> lie. You. Thank you. I, 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 I made well. I'm, 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 I don't think I'm quite as old as you because I'm not as gray as you are, but that, that's quite a bear there with the holiday season coming up. I bet you're going to be real popular. Well, I've had this beard now, I think about three or four years. I just got tired of shaving. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> the hell with this. I said, I'm old enough now to uh, tell everybody <laughs> that I can't shave anymore. And you got nobody telling you you can't, no no bosses or anything like that telling you you can't. You nope. be clean cut American Ken Patera. Nope. Speaking of clean cut Ken Patera, Kenny, yeah. you know, we, 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 we uh, the three of us, we, we go back a, a ways there, but you know, you and I have met each other shortly after you got in the business there. Yeah. I kind of just, uh, you, you come from such a great athletic family, too. I want, we want to touch on that. Your brother was coach of the uh, uh, professional coach, coach to the Vikings, I believe, or something like that at one time. Yeah. Well, he started off with uh, uh, LA Rams right. for four years. This is then Jack he, Patera, right? Jack. Yeah. Patera. Patera. And then he went to uh, the New York Giants for two years, then he did, he did go to uh, Seattle Seahawks. Oh, see, I say that's where he made his name without Seattle. Right, well, in, in uh, that particular year, I think it was 74, he was the first head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. And well, the, 72 were... to 74, right. Because uh, the, the Seahawks, I think, is. Seahawks and the Buccaneers came out the same year. He was there for a while, though. He made a hell of a name and, and turned that franchise into from a from a from a fledgling franchise into a winning franchise. I know Tampa Bay was always following because we come along the same year, and we were always envious of, of Seattle and how yeah. they were how how they were building their program out there. But you had another brother that was a player also. I had uh, two other brothers, Dennis and Norman. And Norman was a running back, and then he just, I don't know, he had some attitude problems. No, I not think, a Patera. <laughs> yeah. <I think. laughs> yeah, so he he never went pro, but my, uh, my youngest brother, Dennis, he was a hell of a fullback at uh, Brigham Young University. And then uh, he got into kicking because I was kicking. But I wasn't on the football team. Uh, I never went out for football in uh, college. So he he's, uh, wanted me to teach him how to kick field goals. I said, yeah, we can do that. So I taught him how to kick field goals. Were you a soccer kicker or how, how did you pick up kicking it? No, I kicked uh, with the toe, like uh, Lou, Lou Groza. Lou the toe. Lou the toe Lou Groza. <laughs> I kicked just See, well, like, that, that shows you how old we are when we know Lou the who Lou the toe grows is. <laughs> from the 50s and 60s. <laughs> Baltimore coach, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Kenny, Kenny, tell us a little about, about your upbringing. You were, you were quite an athlete. You were a wrestler in high school, football player, yep. and, and, and all that. Uh, where, where, did you, where did you grow up? And, and, and tell us a little bit about your athletic family. Yeah, I uh, grew up in Portland, Oregon. I was born in 43. Uh, another wrestler, Billy Jack Haynes. He's from right. Portland. Right. And, well, there were a lot of wrestlers from Portland. When I was 10 years old, I was watching the 53 Olympic Games, or the 52 Olympic Games in 53. Because back in those days, they didn't, you know, they didn't have cable. And they, 
you know, you're lucky to uh, see anything from the year before. The Olympics, uh, uh, you know, the, they were held in uh, Finland. Helsinki, uh, Helsinki. Finland. yeah. Daddy Hodge yeah. took second over that year. Yeah, in 52. So I uh, I was watching the 52 Olympic Games in 53, and I, I uh, turned the station, and somebody else says, I thought you wanted to watch the weightlifting. I said, I do. Well, they just announced that the Olympic uh, or the weightlifting is coming up next. But I, I didn't see the message. So luckily, my uh, friend turned it uh, back to the Olympics. Now we're watching the 52 Olympic Games. And uh, we I think they had about three or four uh, you know, classes. They didn't show everybody. They had everything chopped up. But uh, the the one that I was, I knew who Norbert Shemansky was. He was a Polak from Detroit, Michigan. And uh, he won uh, uh, 52, 56, 60, and 64. Was he lifting he, for the USA or Poland? Yeah, no. USA. Okay. Yeah. And so he was, uh, I, I think he was in the 198 pound class in this Olympic. And then he eventually went up to uh, heavyweight, you know, like 250, 260. But um, this one guy comes out, tries to uh, makes an effort at a, the first lift. He drops it. And then the second competitor comes out, he picks it up, presses it, drops it behind him. No good. Third guy comes out, he failed. The fourth guy comes up and falls down with it on Ooh. his chest. And I said, Jesus. So the first guy to lift that damn weight was Norbert Shemansky. He comes out, makes it no problem easy and then somebody else comes out he wants to try it he damn near killed himself and then so that then norbert he calls for uh a weight that was uh gonna be the olympic record and the world record so he comes out after all these other guys failed and everything he took that barbell, uh, brought it up to his uh, chest, sits there, splits his legs underneath it, boom, makes a lift. All-time new world record and Olympic uh, record. Now, I was so impressed by that. I said, Jesus. And uh, I, I, so I talked to my mom and dad. It was just before Christmas. So they, I told them I'd like to have a weightlifting set. And so they didn't tell me that they got it, but they they had it in two boxes, you know, shipping crates. And it was a 110 pound health waste set. And so God, I, I they put it under the Christmas tree that morning in the back. So I wouldn't see it, I wouldn't be suspicious. And man, when they pulled that those two boxes out for Christmas, I was ten years old, and they uh, uh, they said, "Well, open them up." So I opened them up. Well, I knew what what it was because it was heavy. <laughs> it's 110 pounds, and so you know, plus the bar, plus two little dumbbells, and uh, after about. Let's say I was ten. I think after two years, I could take that hundred and ten pounds, clean it with one arm, and press it. Wow! <laughs> so, so I have this goofy uncle Woody. So Woody says, "Oh, let let me do that." He gets down there. He couldn't pull it off the ground <laughs> or off the floor. And uh, but, but we had that damn set in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> we well, lived in the living room. That's 
we had a wrestling mat in the living room. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Everything happens in the living room. Right. Uh, yeah, so anyway. Or, or the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, right. So anyway, after about a year and a half, I got so I could press that 110 pounds like 10, 11, 12 times with one arm. Wow. With my right arm. And, and how I, old were you that time? I was uh, I was just 12 or <laughs> getting ready to turn 12. And uh, my mom says, we're going to have to buy you some uh, more weights. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh, huh. Got a friend of mine, uh, Lanny. He lived down the street. Uh, I got him interested in lifting. So he came up. He only lived two, three blocks away. So he came up and uh, I showed him the uh, workout schedule that they had mailed along with the uh, barbell plates. And uh, he was a tall, tall kid. He wound up being like six, five, six, six. And uh, kind of, you know, not real muscular or anything, but he, he loved lifting weights. So at least I had a, somebody to lift weights with me. Didn't matter how strong he was or anything, you know, just as long as you have somebody there. And that, know. That's a sport that's really important to have somebody that, that, that can lift with you, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise it's boring. I mean, you know, you guys know you, you've lifted weights before. If you don't have a partner or somebody helping you out or encouraging you, uh, it's hard. It's hard to lift them. <laughs> but if you have if you have somebody there rooting for you, then uh, I don't know why you always get stronger that way. I didn't uh, go to any gyms or anything. Well, there weren't any except one. Now that was uh, fifty three. <laughs> So that was in 55 when Lanny started working out with me. Then in 58, three years later, there was this gym that opened up exactly one mile up the street. From a 110 weight uh, load, what, what, had, what had you advanced up to them about three years later after you'd been working out? Oh, God. Yeah, we only lifted during the summertime because we played football, basketball, and uh, track and field. Um, and then, uh, I wrestled for two seasons. Uh, so good. I was playing basketball and wrestling at the same time. Wow, that's hard to do. <laughs> Real hard. So then I got in an argument with the coach. She says, Ken, you got to do the wrestling full time. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, there's no sense in you even being on the team. I said, well, I'm winning. He said, I don't care. He says, you have to be here all the time. And so uh, starting my third season wrestling, I quit. Yeah, you know, I retired from amateur wrestling. <laughs> when did you start realizing that you were stronger than everybody else? Did you know at that time? Yeah. Yeah, because I could do, uh, before getting the, the weights, I was able to do one-arm pull-up. Please like three three reps with one arm and my left arm I could get two uh two reps out of that but my right arm for some reason I got up to five and now that this one I was 12 years old wow. and six and then seven I just kept getting stronger uh of course my body weight increased but uh, as I got heavier, I got stronger, in other words. And I, you know, I was getting old. I was an old man. I was 12 <laughs> years old. <laughs> I got up to 10 reps with, with one arm pull ups uh, when I was 12 years old. And that, that's when I knew I was stronger than everybody else. When I got to high school, I was 12. And then I turned 13 in November. And uh, so I went out for the basketball team. 
because uh, they didn't have football or anything else. They had basketball and baseball or softball. They didn't even have a baseball team. So, and that was a big, big grade school. I think we had uh, 1,100 or 1,200 kids in that grade school. And that was in, you know, 1950, my junior year. I played football, basketball, and that, that's when I wrestled. Uh, and then uh, the next year, and track and field. Ken, what did you decide? You you, you wanted to, you wanted to be a shot putter first, right? Wasn't that your first big thing in track before you started weightlifting? No, uh, hurdling and high jumping. Oh, wow. I my freshman year, yeah, you know, I only weighed one hundred and sixty pounds or one hundred and fifty five pounds, and uh, because I, I was a year and a half to two years younger than everybody else, and so. Uh, I was a good high jumper for my age. I was high jump like five nine, and then uh, I ran the high hurdles. Back in, if you could high jump six foot, you were you were you were considered a world class high jumper almost, right? <laughs> well, I I did jump. Uh, I high jumped six one, uh, my senior year, and I weighed one hundred ninety pounds. And uh, I threw the shot put uh, 55 feet even on my last attempt at the state tournament. And this is the catch. The next year, I grew three inches and gained like 30 pounds you know, from, from I, I joined a gym by them. And the gym was uh, Sam LaPrenzi's gym. And all, all the wrestlers worked out at Sam LaPrinzi's gym. I took second in state. And uh, I took I, I won the city championship at Cleveland High School. I won that. And then uh, uh, a couple of weeks later, we went down to Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. And I uh, took uh, second. Uh, and so then the next year, uh, we went from the 12 pound shot to the 16 pound shot, you know, college, because we were in college by then. And the kid that beat me at the state championship uh, threw almost 60 feet, he was like 59, 10. And so we, now the next year we're in college, he's thrown around, I don't know, 49, 50 feet with the heavier shot put. So I step up there, I threw uh, like 58, 58, five or something like that. This kid, he quit shot putting okay. after that. <laughs> he says, he said, I'll never be able to beat you anymore. I said, well, you're, uh, you know, who, who matters? Uh, that doesn't matter. I said, if you like shot putting, we're not going to be in every meet together. Yeah, because he's from a different uh, university. So I, I got cracked up on that. So anyway, uh, we, uh, um, I, th then I came back to Portland after I, I got in an argument with the head coach. Uh, Lyle Smith was his name. He was an old uh, Marine. And at that time, uh, he was about 65, and, but just hard as nails type of guy. And I, I was uh, playing, we got in an argument again. And so I uh, packed up my stuff from the dormitory, uh, big box of stuff, and went down the Greyhound bus depot and I went back to Portland, Oregon. And so I didn't do anything the rest of that year. Well, I got, got a job because uh, my parents would have me if I didn't uh, have a job and working, you know, trying to make something out of myself, you know, 1961, 62. So uh, anyway, the guys I was running around with were just bad apples. 
you know, and of course, at that time, I wasn't any kind of a leader. I was a follower. I followed these guys into all kinds of trouble. And uh, then in 63, I realized if I was going to do anything in athletics, I'm going to have to get away from that type of crowd. And we were out going down these bars and stuff. You know, we're 18, 19 years old, you know, getting in fights with everybody and uh, not start any, but just, you know, we're you know, young kids, you know, will not turn down a fight for anything. I, I mean, that was the highlight of the night. <laughs> I got out of that group, went to uh, Portland State University. And uh, the track coach down there was really, really knowledgeable about shot putting, discus throwing, and so, and weightlifting. Uh, so uh, I did real well there. I, as a matter of fact, I got on the track and field team. NAIA, small college. Uh, the Nationals were in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So we get on the airplane, fly into Sioux Falls. And the thing I got, the mo most impressive thing I, I re remember about Sioux Falls was the size of the raindrops. The raindrops were like uh, silver dollars, and it would rain. It only rained for about 15, 20 minutes, then stop. Then an hour later, another cloud burst would come over. But anyway, uh, it was raining so damn hard that we had to throw the shot underneath uh, one of the stadiums. And, uh, of course, it wasn't a big stadium. It was just small college so i'm down there i'm putting i'm i'm my warm-ups were two three feet ahead of this guy that uh, eventually beat me and uh so anyway on my last throw i come across a circle and i throw the shot out and hit the top uh, it hit the bottom of the uh, stand. Kenny, I'm going to jump in. And it, that back in the, that your stall back there, it was just backwards, and you turned, or did you, was you in, in the spinning uh, no. class? A glide, the Perry O'Brien uh, glide, they called it. Yeah. yeah, and so I launched that shot put, and it hit the bottom of the steps and came straight down. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And the guy that beat me, beat me by a half an inch. <laughs> and, you know, so if we were able to throw, you know, out in the field like we were supposed to, but because of the rain, they moved us uh, underneath. So anyway, uh, I took second there. And that kind of built a fire in me you know i said i gotta do better than this geez so i go back to portland with the team of course and then uh about six months after that i talked to bill bowerman down at the university of oregon and he gave me a half scholarship on the track and field team bill bowerman's the one that invented nike you you know Nike shoes, right? Yeah, yeah. And so anyway, uh, he gave me a half scholarship. I went down there. This is sound, this is going to sound like I, you know, I, that I had uh, uh, a problem with authority and stuff like that. But about eight months after that, never, never. <laughs> I, and I got kicked out of the University of Oregon. I you said, quite, quite a track record there, Kenny. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kicked out of every goddamn place I ended up. So, so anyway, now you now, sure you're not from Texas? <laughs> That's not necessary. <laughs> then uh, in 65, that was the year I was supposed to graduate from college. And here I'm, you know, a sophomore going into my junior year. 
And my younger brother, Dennis, uh, the one that kicked field goals, as a matter of fact, he kicked field goals for the 49ers for two years. Wow. And then uh, his wife, Lynn, made him quit because she thought it was too uh, too violent. I told her, I said, Lynn, he's making it. He was making like 27,000. No, no, no. 17,000 a year back. And that was in what year was that? 66, 67, something like that. I said, where else is he going to make that kind of money? The average job only paid like 5000 a year back in those days. I called him up. I said, Dennis, I just got kicked out of the University of Oregon. He said, well, what did you do? I said, well, I don't want to talk about it. So we got in a fight, uh, me and a couple of buddies of mine up at uh, Reed College. We went to a party over there and got in a fight. So then the, the dean of men there at Reed College, at that time, they uh, sent more kids to, to get Rhodes Scholars than any other university in the country. That's quite a different Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. So instead of Vietnam, they went, uh, I can't remember. That's during, that's during my time. That's where we, when you flunked out of school, that's where you had to go. Yeah. <laughs> you out of school. Well, that's the reason you stayed in school. Yeah, yeah. I did. I only reason. About my Vietnam experience. Well, there wasn't one. I went down <laughs> Into the no, Marine. you didn't go to Oxford, did you? That would no. blow my mind if you tell me you got a scholarship to Oxford. No, no, no. I, I was neither a Rhodes Scholar or a soldier. <laughs> I kicked out of both of them. I go down to be inducted with two other friends of mine, Hi Mac and Ernie and Roy Lucas. They both passed away now. But they both got inducted, and the sergeant... Uh, he comes over to me and says, Ken Patera, we're going to have to deny you uh, for the Marine Corps. I said, why? He said, well, we got the x-rays of your back and your fourth and fifth lumbar are cracked. I said, yeah, I was born with that. I said, uh, he said, well, it looks more like a brick to us. I didn't tell him that I fell off a cliff, you know, forty foot cliff. <laughs> fell off, fell off, or thrown off? No, fell off. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I wasn't able to get into the military in '65. So I called my younger brother. He was at Brigham Young University, and I told him what had happened. I, I said I got kicked out of school again. And uh, they won't take me in the military because of my back. And he says, well, why don't you come down here to bring them young? I said, well, that's what I was thinking about. So uh, I talked to the head coach. And he says, we'll send you a plane ticket. We'll fly you down here to Provo, Utah, and see how you like the campus and everything. We'll give you a tour. And everything. He said, how are your grades? I said, well, my grades are good. I said, I have no problem there. It's just everything else. <laughs> so, Discipline. <laughs> yeah, right. So I sent him my transcript, no problem. And uh, I fly down there, beautiful campus, you know, right in the mountains, uh, in the uh, Uinta Mountains. Mountains, I think it was, just south of Salt Lake City, about 30, 40 miles. So anyway, uh, in the fall, that was in the spring, I beat their school record in the shot put. And uh, it was just a practice, you know, and the, they brought out one of their shot putters, a you know, big guy. And uh, we were thrown, I think he threw like 61 or 62. And I threw like 63, yeah, which was, if it was um, legalized, you know, it would have been a new school record. So I go down there and I, I'm getting good grades. You know, I like the school. Everything is going good. I get along with everybody. 
There's no way I was going to get kicked out of here. That first year, oh, I, what I did, I injured my wrist. So I wasn't able to go to the Nationals or anything. But my senior year, the next year, I won the Indoor Nationals at Cobo Arena in Detroit. So I won uh, the Nationals there. And I, I, I was winning everything that I entered. I, I was putting around between 64 and 66, every, every meet practically. So anyway, uh, I had a few bad meets, but yeah. Uh, the ones that counted were good. What was nice little 60, 65, 11, I think. Wow. And w w which was third. Uh, Randy Matson, the world uh, record holder, uh, won it with like 67 or something like that. And then uh, Neil Steinhauer, uh, an old teammate from the University of Oregon, he took second. And then I took third. But that was good, you know. I won the hammer thrower. I hadn't been throwing the hammer but like two months. So I went out there. I took third, I think third or fourth in the hammer. Wow. And uh, I placed in the discus or I can't remember. But that amount of points, you get points for every event. That pushed us into uh, third place team-wise. And uh, the coach was just tickled to death. They, they had never placed that high in the nationals before. And, uh, but we, we, we really had a good team. We had kids from uh, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, uh, Sweden, um, Ireland. So, we, we, well, the Mormons, you know, bring them young university. And so it's a, it's a, uh, the Mormon church owns and runs that. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. Great but university out there. They, they have, they've always had great athletic programs throughout yeah. uh, BYU. Yeah, they have. A great wrestling program, too. Yeah. Yeah, basketball, everything, track and yeah, field. Anyway, during this shot putting day, obviously you were weightlifting, too. Was your weight just going up like crazy on the weightlifting? Yeah. Well, uh, my senior year at Brigham Young, I entered the collegiate uh, weightlifting championships. I think they were in uh, New Mexico, uh, Albuquerque. So I drove down there with a couple of teammates. I entered that and I won that easy. We had uh, four or five other heavyweights from, uh, I, I remember this one kid from University of California, uh, or no, uh, Southern California. So the competition was good, but I just smoked everybody. I mean, I, I, I think I won by I don't know, 150 pounds. Was that was that the time you realized, hey, weightlifting's my my specialty here? I'm, I'm no now no no. I took a couple, couple more years. <laughs> hey Ken, Ken, was that was that Olympic lifting or was that the, the big yeah. squat deadlift? No Olympic lifting. Olympic. Yeah. Yeah, I like the Olympic lifts. I, I didn't care too much for the power lifts, you know. The power lifts I considered, well, I'll, I'll do those when I'm throwing the shot or discus, you know. But um, then there's this other sport called Olympic lifting. <laughs> so I, uh, I just continued doing the Olympic lifts. And then uh, in 60, yeah, in 68, uh, they had the Olympic trials for track and field down at Echo Summit, just above Lake Tahoe. And they they went in there with bulldozers and everything and carved and, and carved out a track in uh, trailer houses for all the athletes and a big uh, cafeteria, you know, was made out of like six trailers. And it put right in the right in the woods. I couldn't believe it, you know. I said, "How long did this uh, take to build?" They said, "We worked on this facility for two and a half years." 
Wow. But they really made, they made it nice. So anyway, this is comes to the end of my shot putting. I took fourth. They only take the top three to the Olympics. First, second, third. The kid that beat me beat me by a quarter inch. Ooh. Oh. 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 I, he had never come within two feet of me. But all those guys got on the steroids in 64. And I mean, I heard all kinds of rumors, but I never took, never took them. And here, this kid beats me by a quarter inch. And a friend of mine, a hammer thrower, uh, <coughs> tells me, he said, well, Ken, I told you, if you don't take these uh, steroids, you're going to get beat. And I says, yeah, I guess his name was George Krem. He was a hammer thrower. He made the team. And as a matter of fact, I think he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated that year. I jump in my car, drive back to Portland. And, uh, and I, I was married at the time. Then I got in an argue, argument with my wife. She says, I told you you weren't, weren't going to make the team. Hey, if you don't try, you're never going to succeed in life. I started going to the weightlifting gym all the time. And we, uh, that, now I started getting good. And, um, you know, let's say I made 400 pounds in the clean and jerk. You know, the next month I'd probably do 410, then eventually 420, 430. Next thing I know, yeah, you know, I'm getting ready to do 500 pounds. I was unheard of. Nobody in the world's ever lifted 500, 500 pounds. And uh, so uh, that December of 68, I, uh, I cleaned the 500, it was 501, cleaned it, stood up with it, and uh, went for the jerk, my knee buckled. So not bad, you know, but anyway, I missed the 500. Well, nobody had ever heard of lifting 500 pounds. You know, here, some young kid out in Portland, Oregon, you know, pretending to be a weightlifter and so anyway, they knew me as a as a track and field guy, right. you know, shot put, discus, hammer. And my first meet was about a month after that, up in a little uh, town in uh, up by Seattle called Everett, Washington. I think that's where Boeing aircraft is. So I go up there and uh, the meet, uh, those meets used to forever and now it's 1 30 in the morning i'm the last lifter 1 30 in the morning and so i go out there and the place was full nobody left and so because you know the uh meat direct announced that ken patero will uh, possibly be attempting a 500 pound clean and jerk tonight and uh, I mean, it was a rare, no, nobody had ever tried it, let alone made it. I think the world record was 486 at that time. And here, 15 pounds heavier, I'm going, you know, 501. I go out there, I clean it. I mean, jump, I clean it and jump right up with it. I couldn't believe it. I said, Jesus, huh. it, you know, freaked me out. Just one of those lifts that everything was magic, huh? Everything went right, yeah. And then I, I went with the jerk, and the goddamn board slips. Uh, the part of the platform wasn't uh, nailed to the uh, entire platform. So here, thing slips, and boom, I drop it in front of me. They still submitted it, though. Because I, I did jerk it, but I, I wasn't quite able to get both my feet together again. And that's what you have to do. 
in order to be recognized for a world record. And so then uh, one thing after another. I had a hell of a career. I, I, I won the national, senior nationals uh, four years in a row uh, in the heavyweight division. I don't think anybody had ever done that. And then uh, I had uh, every meet I entered, I set some kind of record. At this and, time, professional wrestling wasn't even in your mind, though, right? No. No. The farthest thing from my mind. And so then I won uh, uh, the junior nationals. Uh, and every record, every lift was a new record. And uh, so then uh, um, my senior year uh, went. I won the nationals again. That <coughs> when they had to go to the uh, Olympics. So, but in between there, I went to world championships uh, three years in a row. And uh, first year I got dysentery over in Warsaw, Poland, lost about thirty pounds in three days. And then the next year was in uh, Lima, Peru. I took second in the world championships there and I had a bum, bum knee again. That knee bothered me for 30 years. My knee was like football. My knee, I, I had injured that like two, three times a year because it was so weak and everything. I needed an operation. Well, I didn't have any money, you know, and I, Back in those days, you know, if you're an amateur, you you couldn't accept any money. You couldn't accept anybody helping you uh, do anything. It was really a shitty setup right. yeah. in in this country. You, you know? You're not a United States was set to fail at all Olympics because of that. Because at the time, Europeans were paying their athletes big time, and, and oh, they were, yeah. Fucking uh, my competition, they were all driving Mercedes Benz, <laughs> walking around with nice leather coats and uh, living in houses, you know. Oh, I was living in a nice house too, but I had to pay for it. Yeah. You know, that, which means I was, I had to work. You you were many, uh, many uh, Munich Olympics in 1972, and uh, that's one of the tragic Olympics of, of all time there. And we were discussing a little bit beforehand. You saw the, the massacres of, of the other athletes across the, the courtyard from your building into their yeah. building. Yeah, I sure did. It was like 5.30 in the morning. And uh, I was still in bed. I was just ready to get up, though. And one of, the, one of my teammates came in my room and says, Ken, Ken, did you hear about the Israeli team? I said, no, what about them? They, they got shot up by a bunch of terrorists. I said, well, hell, I can see them right out the window here. So I pulled the curtain back, and sure enough, there's, uh, oh, shit, there had to be five or six terrorists there, all with ski masks on, holding guns. Uh, German uh, uh, police, they had a couple of helicopters land. Then they had those half tracks, um, military. The, there had to be 10 of those. And they must have had 300 guys, 300 soldiers uh, on the ground, you know, surrounding the whole compound. And we, we're lucky uh, to see it. It was a horrible situation, but I knew a couple of guys, but they, the, the, the ones I knew, affiliated with the team one was the coach and one was the lifter but they uh i don't even think they were there that day they were at the training hall or, or they, any of the terrorists they wanted a uh helicopter to take them to the airport the police and the uh, military they said okay it took them like five or six hours to coordinate this thing how to get them to the airport. So they finally got a helicopter. I think there were two helicopters. So anyway, they load them up. And then the second one, they loaded up, you know, with uh, 
sharpshooters and they get get out to the airport and uh, the athletes get out. They had them all bound and gagged and everything. So they get to the airport and the German uh, police, they had 10 or 12 sharpshooters, you know, snipers. They had a bunch of them laying down on the tarmac in a circle. And they had uh, uh, the terrorists uh, surrounded and the helicopter, everything. This one terrorist, he pulls one of those uh, grenade phosphorus, a phosphorus uh, gr grenade, you pop it and it burns. Right. They threw a couple of those in the helicopter and just fried the uh, Israeli uh, athletes, it burned them up. And so now there's a big gunfight out there on the tarmac. And uh, German police, I can't remember how many they, they uh, killed, but it was a lot, like 10 or 12 uh, Germans uh, got killed. In thing. And so I'm back in my dormitory, and that was September 11th. Wow. I was supposed to compete that day. So what do they do? They canceled the Olympics. I'm thinking to myself, you know, even though I have a bad day, I might be able to pull this thing out. And uh, so they, the coach comes in, um, says, Ken, they've canceled the Olympics. What do you want to do? I said, they cancel it. They didn't postpone it or no, they canceled it. I says, holy shit. So I knew a lot of the guys on the track and field team, you know, shot putters, hammer throwers. So I uh, went down into the lobby area and they were all down there. And I said, well, what do you guys want to do? Let's go downtown Munich and get fucked up. <laughs> I says, well, you know, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so anyway, about, oh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine of us, we jump on the, they had just finished the subway. Uh, yeah, beautiful subway there from the Olympic Village to downtown Munich. So we went downtown Munich on the subway. And we, uh, for some reason, they, that they were closing the bars like at one, one or two o'clock while they left them open all night that night. So we were downtown uh, Munich for uh, I don't know, almost 12 hours. Man, we got fucked up. And so we got back to Olympic Village like six in the morning. So I hear this knock on my door, Rudy Sablo, he is a team uh, uh, organizer. He says, Ken, you got to get up. Get up, Ken. I said, get out of here, Rudy. He said, no, you have to get up. We, we have to go way in. I said, way in? I just got back to the, we were downtown uh, Munich all night. So how much beer did you drink? I said, I know, Rudy, a lot. He said, well, you got to get up. We got we got to catch, catch a bus downstairs that'll take us to the Olympic Village to get weighed in. You know, instead of weighing in at night, just before the um, competition, they had us weigh in in the morning. So we get over to the Olympic Village about 11.30. Yeah, man, I'm hungover. Big time, big time hangover. So we get over there, we get weighed in. I said, Rudy, what now? Yeah, it took us two hours to get over there. It's a half an hour drive. The traffic was just outrageous. He says, well, I said, well, if we go back to the Olympic Village, it's going to take two hours, and then we have to come back two hours. 
I said, that's four hours on that fucking bus. I said, uh. so anyway, we went back to Olympic Village, laid down for about an hour, hour and a half. Nothing to eat. You made you know, weight, you... though. That's surprising. You were able to make weight. Yeah, 322. <laughs> uh, 322. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My fat Russian competitor weighed, uh, I think, 345. Wow. Uh, yeah, it weighed me by over 20 pounds, 30 pounds, something like that. See, the first two years I was in the world championships, I beat him. The last two, he beat me because my knee injury and so anyway before we went over to the olympics uh i i finally got enough money together uh to have my knee uh operated on but that was a bad thing to do because back in those days knee surgery took six to ten months to heal like now now it's a couple months i'm lifting in the olympics the most important event of the year and i'm oh i was so pissed off i said i i go out and i made my first press then uh oh the knee was killing me anyway uh i missed my third press it was uh 508 508 i pressed it easy and got dizzy dropped it behind me instead of in front so uh i don't even know what my opener was it wasn't much 475 i think why i'm in third place and uh uh here comes the next event is a two-hand snatch and i said well i'm gonna start nice and light you know so i at least get one in I go out there, my knee had swollen up so much from the first event that I couldn't even squat down. I missed all three of my snatches. And I said, fuck, here we go again. You know, uh, four and a half or three and a half years, I trained for this goddamn thing. And uh, my knee was uh, in. So I, I just bombed out because of the injury. And Vern Gagne had brought his whole family over there. And Greg Gagne and I, after how, the how Olympics, did I want to back up a little bit. How did Vern know of you? At, because you're a West Coast athlete. Uh. Yeah. Uh, well, my brother was a defensive line coach for the Minnesota Vikings. And he got to know Vern because Vern was good friends of Bud Grant, the head coach. Uh, they played football and basketball together at the University of Minnesota back in the 40s and uh, was in the world championships in uh, Cleveland, oh, no, Columbus, Ohio. So I said, well, I haven't seen my brother for a while. So I, I called him and I told him I'd be coming through on my way to Portland. So I stopped in Minneapolis on the way to Portland. I stayed with my brother for oh, about eight, nine days, I guess. And uh, and his family, and he was defensive line coach. So he said, well, why don't you stop by here and I'll take you down to the training camp. So we, uh, so I got in and the second day, their training camp had op opened up. And it was about 50 miles south of uh, Minneapolis in a college town down there. I can't think of the name of it right now. Was it Mankato? Yeah, Mankato. How do you know that? I, I, I'm i smart. I'm from Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Do you believe that, John? No, not at all. I believe he's from Oklahoma, but that means he's not smart. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't. It means that he was smart enough to get out of there. That yeah. is exactly right. 
You know, Mag, let's get car. back to Mag, Magcato. Magcato is a, a famous training facility uh, for wrestlers, for track and field, and all that, the weight lift, all that stuff. I know I know about Magcato State College. It, 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 yeah. It's full of great athletes, yeah. Yeah, okay. You know more about it than I do, and I, <laughs> I'm in Minnesota right now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we go down to Mankato. I'm on crutches at the time because I, I broke my ankle during the competition. Man, you and, were injured a pro round, pro round, and I, oh, left <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You know, I was injured all the time as a shot putter, but I switched to weightlifting because I liked it more. I had more potential. But uh, the injuries followed me right through the to the Olympics. And so anyway, we get down to Mankato and uh, we go out to the field. He's coaching. So I'm sitting in the stands and uh, there's really no place for me to sit down on the field. So I just stayed by the stands for about, I think it was three, four hours. We get back into the locker room. He introduces me to uh, the fearsome foursome. Carl Eller, uh, Alan Page, Jim Marshall, and Gary Larson. I think every one of those guys was all pro. Yeah. I mean, they were unbelievable. I think they're all Hall of Famers probably too, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> they, I think, they should be. So they started in 1960 as a franchise. And so uh, he had already been to Los Angeles Rams and the New York Giants. And so this was his third stop as a NFL coach. He had a hell of a position there, making good money. So I met all the football players, great guys. And uh, the, they were impressed with me because how much weight I could lift. You know, about two months before that, I set a, a American record in the in the press, 5-0. 507 and clean and jerk. I uh, set another record uh, being the first American to ever lift 500 pounds. And um, so that they're really impressed with all that because they all lifted weights, but nothing like, you know, I did. Before I left, he said, well, what, what do you want to do when you're done with the Olympics and weightlifting? I said, well, I met a couple of pro wrestlers at Sam LaPrinzi's gym, and they kind of encouraged me to turn pro, um, you know, get into pro wrestling. And, you know, being uh, uh, a fan since 1953, I said, yeah, I think uh, I'll give it a try. And so I told my brother that. He says, well, have you ever heard of Vern Gagne? I said, no. He said, well, he's a champion here. And he's also the promoter. And I, he said, I, I know him fairly well. He said, I'll give him a phone call and you go down uh, and visit with him tomorrow and uh, tell him that you're gonna move back here after the Olympic games. And so I went down to the wrestling office and talked to Vern and, Court versus, well, what makes you think you're tough enough to be a pro wrestler? I, well, I don't know. I said, I have to give it a try to find out. And the Crusher and the Mad Dog were there at the same time. He says, hey, Crusher, come over here. Me, Ken Pateri. He said, yeah, he had a cigar, you know. Rah, 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 rah. And uh, those guys lived live their character to the hilt. It's not like now, yeah. Now everybody's scripted. But anyway, back in those days, you're yourself. And I love that, you know, you say whatever you want. Well, you couldn't say fuck. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that kind of upset me a little Only bit. Only on our show. <laughs> yeah. That's all right to swear, isn't it? No, it is. and it's all right to talk about Oklahoma too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I met those guys, and I told Vern that I'd like to 
you know, come back to Minneapolis and train under him. He says, that's a good idea. I said, uh, I'm going to go to the Olympics first as a weightlifter. Well, what makes you think you're good enough to go to the Olympic Games? I said, I'm not just going. I'm going to win the gold medal. And he liked that. You had to have every world record existing at the time, though, close to it anyway, didn't you? A lot of them. I had 73 records at that time. <laughs> you know, national records. That's, that's, the, that's the reason I think I can be a pro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Anyway, I went back to Portland and continued my training and stuff. And then Vern called me. He says, well, why don't you come back here and train? I said, well, that's not a bad idea. So I got in my car and drove I think it was like 1,700 miles from Portland. So I drove back nonstop, never stopped. You know, goddamn road warrior. <laughs> and so I got back there. I stayed with my brother for about four days. I, I met a guy uh, uh, that uh, had, a, had a big house. So he had a... a he had another weightlifter, uh, Don Cundy. He's world record holder in the deadlift, and he was going to dental school. So uh, him and his wife were renting out the top floor of his house over in St. Paul. And so I just rented a room right off the kitchen. And uh, he had a big German shepherd, female. And that damn German Shepherd, after I was there for about a week, she'd jump up in my bed and pee. Huh. She peed in my fucking bed four or five times. <laughs> and Mel says, well, are you locking the door? I said, yeah, I locked the fucking door. So anyway, somebody was letting her in. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I said, well, Mel. I said, I'm going to have to move. In the meantime, I had met Rick Flair. And Rick and I were became pretty good friends. And uh, so uh, Rick invited me to his 21st birthday party. Well, it was just, just him and his girlfriend, who he eventually married. Her name was Leslie Goodman. Real nice girl. Too nice for Rick. <laughs> <laughs> they all were. <laughs> yeah. All laid of them, are they? <laughs> Been married five, six? A lot. I count, lost count of four. <laughs> yeah, right. I just talked to Rick a couple months ago, but we never talked about the marriages. <laughs> Rick and I, we can't find a, an apartment. <clears throat> And the uh, friend of his said, why don't you guys rent a house? And I said, yeah, that sounds better. That'd be better than an apartment. So we go over to South Minneapolis and there was this big fucking house uh, for rent. I think it was like $165, $175 a month. Shit, nowadays that thing costs two and a half, three thousand. 3000 uh, we get uh, this other kid. Uh, he's a bartender. His name was Pat. He was a real nice guy. Hell of a bartender. Drink all day, all night. Perfect for us. <laughs> so we get moved in over there. And I was selling water beds. Huh. I got into the business. And so I had this big inventory in my bedroom. I must have had 20 or 30 water beds. So, all inflated, all 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 pulled up with water or what? No, 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 no. We, we only, uh, I think we set up two of them. You had the storage of, uh, you were storing all your mattresses in there. Yeah. Right. Huh. Now, one I of thought, the, man, what, what, what Rick Flair, you never know, man. All <laughs> could have been filled up. Oh, what a character. And we love Rick, too. Rick's a friend of ours over here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But he, Rick oh. is the 
quickest guy I've ever met to get to know. He, he has that personality. Right. He, and so we set this one water bed up right in the dining room because we didn't have any dining room furniture. So we set this thing was eight foot in uh, circumference, the big circular water bed. And within a week, all these kids from the neighborhood, they were coming in, <laughs> jumping up and down on my goddamn water bed. Well, how'd that happen? Well, Rick, would you guys want to jump on the water bed? Yeah. So, fuck. But they were they were strong water beds, so it was all right. And uh, so uh, uh, Pat Nalen was uh, our roommate's name, Pat Nalen. Uh, he had a girlfriend, Northwest. Uh, water uh, attendant. Water. Uh, flight attendant. And uh, I got to do the same thing for JBL, kid. So don't go back. <laughs> What's that? I got to do the same thing for JBL. I got to help him out. <laughs> His vocabulary and and <laughs> yeah. Well, hell, I don't know. About two, three years ago, I my it's not my uh, uh, memory, but yeah, you know, putting words together and yeah. and remembering places. I'm getting a little slow on that. Maybe. I don't have Alzheimer's or dementia or anything like that. So don't start any rumors out there. I, um, hey, hey, Ken, I don't mean to cut you off, but I can't tell if Jerry has dementia or not because he's from Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm from Portland, Oregon, so, we, you know, it's a, <laughs> a toss-up. So the kids in the water bed jumping on your water bed uh, by Ric Flair's invitation into your bedroom. Right. Well, I was in the dining room. Okay. It wasn't into my bedroom. Uh, I never set one up in my bedroom. He I, just had one in a dining room. Well, that's kind of strange, Kitty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I had a few girls on that, you know. Drunker than a skunk and rolling all over on that fucking water bed, you know. <laughs> Every night, it seemed like. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was only four or five nights a week. But it seemed like every night we had a party there. Because uh, uh, when I met Rick, he was uh, bouncing at a, at a big bar called George's in the Park. It was a big nightclub, and uh, they had a working man's bar in the back called Mad Dog Saloon. And uh, it was a hell of a place. The guy that uh, owned it was George Schomburger, uh, who eventually wound up in prison for skimming uh, money and selling cocaine and all Sounds that. like a hell of a place. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it was a gold mine. Rick and I were living in this place. He was selling life insurance for Guardian uh, Life Insurance Company. He wanted to meet Vern Gagne. And I said, well, but this started before I even went to the Olympics. <clears throat> I told him I was gonna, you know, start wrestling for Vern Gagne. Uh, in 68. So he's all over me. So I, I get back from Munich and uh, I said, okay, I'm going to call Vern and set up a date and I want you to go down there. Well, you have to come with me. I says, nah. I said, I've only met Vern once. I said, you can go down there. And so anyway, I, I get a date uh, for him to go down to uh, the wrestling office. It was in uh, the old Dykeman Hotel. No longer exists. He finally got off his ass and went downtown Minneapolis and met Vern. And uh, I, I, I was doing something else. I can't remember. Maybe I was training or something. And so uh, I told Vern, I said, this kid was born to be a pro wrestler. I said, he knows everything about all the the wrestlers. He's got a stack of mag wrestling magazines four feet high in his bedroom. 
I, I said, I've seen it. I said, he wrestled in high school. Uh, as a matter of fact, he got kicked out of a couple high schools. He wound up in a military school over in Wisconsin because uh, when they kicked him out of school, the school authorities told him that he couldn't uh, go to school in Minnesota anymore. <laughs> they yeah. got kicked out of the school system in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so anyway, he goes over there and he won the state high school wrestling championship two years in a row, row his junior and senior year. And uh, it was a real ritzy type of school. And uh, most of the students there were from uh, the Chicago area. You know, their families were all very wealthy. I, I, I told uh, Rick, I said, as soon as I get back from Munich, now this would have been in 1971, something like that. When I get back from the Olympics, we're going to start wrestling. We're going to, we're going to go through Vern's wrestling camp. Oh, great. And this and that. So I took him down to meet Vern a couple more times. And uh, he knew... Uh, Jimmy Brunzel and Greg Gagne from when they were all going out for the football team there at the University of Minnesota. Greg wound up transferring out to Wyoming. And uh, Jimmy Brunzel, he was a wide receiver, I believe. And so uh, Rick was just kicking around, not doing anything. So when I got back from Munich, and then a couple months after that, that's when we got that house. We started training camp in October, October of uh, 72. We had uh, Rick, myself, Greg Gagne, Jimmy Brunzel, and uh, Cosro Vasiri, the Iron Sheik. And another kid that played pro football, um, it was all American at the University of Minnesota by the name of Bob Bruggers. He was originally from Minnesota. I remember so, Bobby. Huh? I remember Bobby. I, I, I He was in Carolina with me for a while. Yeah, nice guy. Uh, there were six of us. And uh, so it really worked out good. So Vern had a farm out west of uh, Minneapolis, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 miles, whatever. So we uh, started wrestling camp, you know, we were training camp, I should say. So we're all out there and uh, we're doing like a thousand free squats every day. Uh, we're doing all kinds of calisthenics, you know, warm ups and stuff. And at the end of the day, after six hours in this fucking training camp, he had us go out and run. And we we started off at this uh, dry uh, uh, riverbed. And it was only, or a creek, I guess. And the fucking thing was all full of rocks. So <coughs> we didn't break an ankle. So we go, we go out and run about a mile and get back. And by that time, because of the time of year, well, it was this time of year. But uh, after about two or three weeks, it started to get cold, really cold in Minnesota. Wow. So one morning we show up at uh, nine in the morning and... Uh, that old barn between each board was probably an, eight, an inch between each board. And the, it was facing west while the wind would blow the snow right through that crack. So anyway, we had the, the wrestling ring on the main floor and below that down in the uh, basement of the barn, uh, Vern had 12 stables for his horses. Well, those horses would shit all night. 
stink the place up. He had a caretaker. But anyway, then the chickens, the barn was full of chicken. So we'd come in uh, to do our wrestling practice nine in the morning. Before we could uh, practice, we'd have to sweep the ring out because the chickens were up in the loft shitting. And I mean, there shit, shit everywhere, my God. And so, and the ropes were, you know, loop de loop, you know, real loose. The ring was as hard as a rock and uneven. And uh, uh, not, not, a, not a first class operation. We were there for, for about four, maybe five weeks in that barn. I mean, Jesus Christ, we were all beat up. We'd go six hours a day. We'd start out with the uh, hens. Well, when we first started doing the free squats, we started off with a hundred. After a week, he had us doing a thousand, 500 at a time. And uh, then we'd do all kinds of calisthenics, Nick Bridges and this and that, jumping jacks, whatever it took. And then we'd go, we'd start in the ring with the moves. We'd run the ropes and run the ropes. Well, the ropes were so loose. Cry, I, we were all afraid of you know going over the top. So we had to, we, uh, to hit the ropes, we had to drop our hip and um, arm way down. And he never changed it, never, never fixed it. I mean, fuck. And so then we'd, we'd bill each other like, you know, you, you get up there, whoever's turn it was, you beal them 10 times. So 10 beals, uh, 10 times throwing you into the ropes, uh, 10 times thrown into the turnbuckle. Then, uh, you know, snap mirrors, we do 10 of those, uh, 10 times practicing headlock. Everything was in 10s. Hmm. And um, so then uh, you do arm drags 10 times. Well, shit, I, by the time you get out of there, you'd have have done like 100, 150, you know, flips, you know, 10 slams, 10 slams, 10 times. And I mean, we were all beat up by the time that thing ended. Well, it got so cold in that barn yeah, I mean, like the wind was blowing the snow through the cracked barn. And uh, one morning we came in there, there's uh, five foot drifts. Oh, wow. Um, the barn, you know, right up to the ring. I said, God, why in the hell are we doing this? Well, we all bitched and complained. So Vern finally moved us over to the uh, St. Paul. Uh, Armory military. Uh, now, is this the time, Kenny, when when Flair quit quit uh, the camp well, he and took had, off? Yeah, I think it was the first week he quit, and then the third week he had quit. Yeah, huh. yeah. So, but uh, Vern straightened him out once, and I straightened him out the other time. He says, "Kenny, I want to quit." I said, "Fuck you! You're not quitting." So. I convinced him not to. I said, Rick, I said, I went to the Pan American Games uh, when we were uh, uh, together. I went to the Olympic Games and all you talked about was professional wrestling. And so every time you mentioned that stuff, I had always talked to somebody uh, in the business, you know, whether it be Vern or Billy Robinson or or somebody, you know. And I said, I've spent the past year, year and a half, babysitting your ass. And now you tell me that you're going to quit? I said, no, I don't think so. I said, you're not quitting. And so uh, I drove him out to practice, out to the barn. And then uh, the other time I didn't, I don't even remember, but Greg told me that 
Rick had stayed home from practice that one day. And I told him, I said, Greg, I absolutely, I swear to God, I don't remember that. But Vern came over to the house and eventually slapped him uh, for telling Vern that he was going to quit and everything. Knocked some sense into him. I said, well, I never hit Rick. You know, I, I just talked him into, you know, not quitting. Now you mentioned Billy Robinson. Did Billy was Billy one of those trainers that would try to hurt you a little bit to show you how tough pro wrestlers were, or what? How was his training? Uh, we're spread eagle, face down, in the ring, and Billy said that he could turn all of us. So he got down there and he, you know, he, he rolled all of us. When it was Cosro's turn, you know, the Iron Sheik. Before Cosro laid down, he says, Coach, always oh, called Billy Coach. He says, You can't turn me. And uh, Cosro was only 180 pounds at that time, but just as hard as steel. Really good shape. You know, hell, he was an amateur wrestler from uh, Iran. A world class you know, athlete, yeah. Yeah, he was in the Olympics, 68 Olympics. So, anyway, he gets down you know uh spread eagle billy could not turn him could not turn him and uh billy gets up you know he's all pissed off you know you're at the front so he said cosro get up on all fours like in an amateur stance and he came down with his knee right into cosro's hip and Oh, I said, I said, Billy, what did you do that for? He said, fucking Cosro, he's being a prick. I said, no, you're being the prick. Anyway, Cosro had a knot on his hip, uh, like a softball, and it was black and blue about four or five days later. And, uh, oh, shit, Cosro was just in serious, serious pain. And... Uh, and that that's when I I noticed the the bad side of Billy. He was a bully. I mean big time bully. And uh, the thing is, you know, over his career, Billy Robinson, over his career, he got he thought he was the world's toughest guy. Well, he got beat up so many Peter Maiva beat him up over in uh Hawaii. Uh, he's Rocky Johnson, uh, or The Rock's uh, grandfather. Right. Samoan tough. And then uh, another time, Sailor uh, Sailor White uh, beat him up in Montreal. Did you ever hear about that? Never heard that one. Yeah, they were in a bar, and uh, Billy picks a fight with him. Well, they were both doing shots of whiskey or something. And so they go outside. It was in the snow. And uh, a street, street fight. So Sailor White catches him with a good good punch. Not, damn near knocks him out. And then he proceeds to put the boots to him. He kicked him in the face and the head and the ribs just kicked the shit out of him. And uh, then he pulls his dick out and pisses on uh, Billy's, <laughs> pisses on his face. And, uh, oh, I don't know, a couple of days later, s some infection set in. So B Billy had to stay in the hospital for a couple of days till they got that infection. Uh, he was so beat up. Sailor White, I mean, busted him up bad you know two black eyes broken nose oh that was an ugly ugly fight uh, and a couple other times he got beat up yeah you know, he get so fucking drunk and belligerent and uh billy was tough if, you, if let's say you you give give him your arm you know to show uh come along or anything like that well, then he could, you know, fuck you up or hurt you if he wanted to. 
So that's where his reputation came from as a shooter, was from taking advantage of people. Billy Rob, uh, Baron Von Raschke, uh, we were already in the business. So it was a couple of years later, Billy Robinson uh, got in another fight and uh, something. Anyway, Baron was there and Baron told him straight out, says, Billy, you're, you're good at taking advantage of people, but you, you could never, as all the wrestling experience and knowledge that you have, there's no way you could beat uh, an average college wrestler. Oh, Billy, it just crushed Billy. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, you know, the Baron, Baron was uh, world class right. uh, wrestler. Yeah. When, yes, they were a Greco champion. Yeah, right. And so when he told Billy that, and they were good friends at the time, uh, getting back to a uh, training camp. So we were in the um, armory over there in St. Paul heat, showers, all kinds of, it was like the Taj Mahal oh. compared to that fucking barn. Yeah. You know, the, the horses down below shitting, the chickens up uh, in the loft upstairs shitting on the ring and there was shit all over the place. Uh, finish up there, uh, middle of December, I believe in the armory. So that was about another three or four weeks uh, from when we left the barn. And uh, so, I mean, we were all in shape, I'll tell you that. We were in shape. Don Morocco would come out and work with us. Uh, Billy. Uh, and uh, then about a week before we left the barn to go over to the armory, um, Chris Taylor and uh, Bob Remus come in. Sarge. Yeah, Sarge. And uh, Bob grew up in uh, Hopkins, Minnesota, which is uh, just a couple minutes from there. And uh, Chris was training for the world uh, championships again in Greco Roman. He thought that he had a chance of winning a gold medal. Well, that didn't didn't pan out. No. And uh, Sergeant Slaughter, um, when he broke, and I don't know what his name was. His real name is Bob Remus. And uh, so anyway, uh, he eventually became Sergeant Slaughter. And he told Vern, he was wrestling for Vern at the time. And uh, Vern uh, said, Sergeant Slaughter, he said that, I'm not going to put that name on you. That's just a corny name. Ne never work. Well, then he goes to New York as Sergeant Slaughter. I'm, uh, the Sheik, the Iron Sheik, Cosro, uh, one of our training partners, he was there. Then the fucking... Uh, war breaks out <laughs> so here's the iron sheik legitimately from iran right bob remus not a legitimate marine corps sergeant but that didn't matter did it <laughs> no. man they drew they something. drew big money big money yeah so drew. you got you got finished up at the army and now 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 you've graduated and yeah. Did you did you immediately go to work for Vern in, in Minnesota, or did you yeah. ship out a little bit? No, I, uh, me and Greg and Jimmy uh, Brunzel, when we when we started wrestling, Wahoo McDaniel was working for Vern. He had a big feud going with uh, superstar Billy Graham and uh, George Scott, who wound up being the booker down in Carolinas. Uh, he was there uh, with us uh, wrestling and a couple other guys. So then when George Scott got the booking uh, job down there at Carolinas, 
of course, uh, he had Wahoo come down, a couple other guys, uh, Reggie. Uh, uh, Reggie Parks. Reggie yeah, Parks. Reggie Parks and uh, a couple other guys. They they went to North Carolina. That's when Bruggers came down also. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's where. So Bob wasn't in Minnesota very long. So he uh, went down there. There were four or five of them. And uh, not too long after that, uh, Rick went down, I think. Yeah. Probably a year later. Probably, I think it was closer to a year. Yeah, okay. But yeah, you're probably right. I was wrestling main event every night. Was you uh, on the plane or the flame, famous flight with uh, Vashon where he opened the door? Was you on that flight? Oh. No, I wasn't even in the territory at that time. And then the plane crash, uh, the the one that... Uh, oh, that's in Carolina. I was, I was talking about when Vashon opened the door to oh, Minnesota. Oh, yeah, uh, up in the Minnesota territory. No, I wasn't... That. Thank goodness you missed that one. <laughs> yeah, I missed that event. Yeah, the fucking Mad, Mad Dog could have got everybody killed. So, Kenny, how, how did you get to New York? Well, I was uh, down in Carolina, and uh, I, I had a feud going with Johnny Valentine at that time. And uh, God, we were drawn. Anybody that was in the main event could sell out any building. It was that hot. It was a great territory, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I wrestled... Uh, 453 times, 453 matches that year. I believe it. I was, I was there for a long time. So I know. Yeah. When. Yeah. Well, you would wrestle three, uh, three times on TV. Yeah. Then, uh, we had a match, uh, you know, somewhere. I can't remember Rocky Mount or something like that. And then uh, we'd have uh, a show every night. Then on Saturdays and Sundays, usually a matinee show in the afternoon and then an evening show somewhere. And that's where we were flying everywhere. Fearless Freddie, the pilot, he's the one that- I, I, knew, I knew Freddie well, yeah. Yeah. Was, was, you in the, was you in the Carolinas when the play went down? Yeah, I was in Roanoke uh, wrestling oh, yeah. Tony that night. I was supposed to go uh, on that plane. Uh, what what was the town? Fayetteville, wasn't it? Huh? North Fayetteville, North Carolina. Oh, uh, it wasn't Fayetteville. It was the one farther south. Wilmington. Uh, huh? Wilmington. Wilmington. Yeah. Wilmington is where that plane went down. Yeah. Well, that he had the plane loaded to max. Right. You know, six big guys and all the bags, and they were flying east into a headwind all the way. And uh, he thought he had enough gas, but uh, because of the wind, they didn't have enough. And that fucking plane went down and hit that railroad uh, embankment. Uh, what was it, about 100 or 200 yards short of the right? Yeah, run just short of the runway. Yeah, if, if just a couple seconds it would have been, they would have been there. And uh, he eventually died. And then uh, I think Davy Crockett and um, that, John, that's. JV, uh, Johnny Valentine, he was crippled for life after that. For life. Bob Bruggers yeah. never wrestled after that, broke his back so back, bad. Back was back. Yeah, yeah and uh, Ric Flair. He was fucked up for a long time. Um, well, it wasn't that long. It was a five, six months. Yeah, it was a while. Yeah, Rick should have never went back uh, that early. Tell us about uh, working for Vince Sr., working with Bruno, before we have to go, before your battery runs out. Well, I, I was in uh, North Carolina, and uh, I had just wrestled uh, Johnny Valentine, and we were that was in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and the place was sold out, of course. 
and I got I got home that night. My wife says, uh, you know Vince McMahon? I says, yeah. He said, well, he called here a couple hours ago. I wanted you to call him. So I called him. He said, if, if it's real late at night, it doesn't matter. About one o'clock at night by the time I got home. And so I called him. I said, uh, Mr. McMahon, the Ken Patera here. Oh, God, I'm glad you called. He says, we need you up to uh, um, for TV. We're going to do uh, three television uh, shoots with you uh, uh, one each month. And uh, then we'll start you in uh, January. And I said, great. I said, uh, anything else? He said, no, that's about it, you know. And he told us they they had big plans for me and everything. I said, well, I really appreciate you. And he said that uh, Bruno talks very highly of Ken Patera, knows all about you, you know, weightlifting and shot putting and all kinds of stuff. And uh so I said, yeah, I talked to Bruno several times and he says, you're, you're the man that makes everything happen up there. He says, yes, I am. <laughs> but he was a real diplomat. He gave you his word. That's all you needed. You know, he never lied to you or anything. And uh, I guess I could have made, made it better for myself, but... <clears throat> Did you go I, immediately? Did you go up for Vince immediately? Vince Senior immediately? Uh, well, it was three months of TV. Right. Yeah, TV every three weeks, and then I started. So, so you were still working Crockett, but you were making Vince's, Vince's TV? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And so, uh, I think that, so that would have been Every three weeks, it would have been uh, like October that I did first TV. And uh, then uh, uh, I eventually uh, started uh, December something. Yeah, Madison Square Garden with Bruno. I said, boy, that's a way. Wow. <laughs> what a place to start, huh? Yeah, yeah. But they had a big... Uh, big freeze uh for like two days three days uh weather was below zero every day so the day of the the night of the uh, our first match it was uh four below zero and uh you know new, new york isn't ready for all that shit you know so the the railroad tracks were freezing and that's how most of the people got in from long island and stuff was on the subway. And so uh, they had a sellout, but there was only like uh, 17 or no, like 14,000 people were able to get to the garden. But it was sold out, you know. And, but but it's, it's legitimately seats 20,000, 19,994, something like that. So anyway, then we did a, a return, and uh, usually guys didn't get return matches unless it was sold out. And but Vince knew what was going on, you know. He didn't blame Bruno and I because we we had a good match. So uh, the next show was sold out completely. Then the third show we did, we came back. It was an all-time attendance record. The garden was sold out, and the felt form down below was sold out. And the felt form, I think, held around 3,500 right. or 4,000, something like that. We had almost 4,600 people in that place. And then they had standing room only in the garden up upstairs, the big garden. So I, I think it was uh, uh, 20, 24,000 
and uh, something, you know. It was almost 25,000 people. And uh, so that, that was a good way to start off. And I made 3,500 for the first two, 35, 35. For the third one, completely sold out. What do you think they paid me? 3500 $350 more. Like, <laughs> well, the expenses, Ken, were as expensive to run at. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> at that time, a sellout was a legitimate sellout was like a hundred thousand, hundred thousand dollars. But fuck, at that time, it cost uh, three thousand to rent the place. Wow. Yeah, very, very, very expensive. And uh, so anyway, I. I told Vince, I said, God, I thought I'd get another thousand. Well, can't, and that's when he told me what it cost to, to run that place. Yeah. So, hey, hey Ken, said, before, we, before we go and before your phone runs out of battery, go back to the strongman because you were right there at the first strongman. Uh, Bill Kazmaier was considered one of the strongest guys. Other than yourself, who, uh -huh. would, you, who would you consider the strongest man? of either your lifetime or all time or, or what do you what would you who would you say is the strongest guy on the planet oh well i i knew paul anderson real well and paul paul was from the 50s and uh you know he claimed all these squat records and you know back lift records i mean thousands and thousands of pounds you know and uh, he had this show out in Las Vegas. Uh, he had two big clip, uh, uh, plexiglass uh, buckets, and they filled up with silver dollars. And they said it was like 850 pounds, I believe it was. And he had a show out there. That, uh, the highlight of that show, like twice a day for a couple of weeks, was that he would squat get under there and squat that uh, 850 pounds or whatever. I, th I think he said it was 1,100, <laughs> but it actually uh, was 750 or 850. And then I, uh, a guy I met from Las Vegas that was uh, involved in that, he says, no, he said those, the, the legitimate weight on those uh, silver dollar cases was like 650 pounds. I said, he fucking lied that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no way somebody's going to come out and, uh, you know, squat 1,100 pounds twice a day for two weeks. Wow. Right. Yeah, well, whatever it was. So Paul, Paul was strong, though. And, well, what uh, kind of guy was uh, Bruce Willis? Bruce was our heavyweight at Oklahoma State when I when I was a, when yeah. I yeah yeah. What what year was that? Sixty two. Uh, so sixty yeah uh, early early sixties. Yeah, sixty. Or mid. I'm sorry, mid sixties. Yeah. Okay. I was there, I was there sixty four to sixty eight. So had, okay. had, had to be had to be after sixty eight. Had to be around seventy nine eighty. Yeah. When Bruce, Bruce, when Bruce got in because Bruce was training for that. Right after the national tournament, he went right into the, that heavy training for Because Rod yeah. Roderick was the same way. He wouldn't let guys train with heavy weight because it's muscle bound, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Back in those days. Uh, things Bruce, were... what, Bruce was a character and a half, too. Or, or, oh, yeah. He called me last week. I'll tell him hello he... for me. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. Uh, he called, and uh, I don't even know what we were talking about. But anyway, uh, he can talk. I mean, yeah, we, we I'll he's tell you. A character. He's a character. He would have been great for this business or for our business. For, for well, he, he bugged me for years and years to get me in, uh, to get him into wrestling. So one, one time he comes back to Minneapolis, he li living out from California. So I says, well, he says, where are we going today? He said, we're going to go to a big town down in Illinois, down by St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, God, what the hell was the name of that fucking town? It was just a little dinky shit town. 
anyway, it's 540 miles one way. So we jump in. I had a big Regency at that time. We drive down there and it rained all the way. And we pulled in, uh, I'll think the name of it. Was it Waverly, I, was it Waverly? No, no. Cape Girardeau? I'm gonna quit guessing at that. No, no, I, I'll think of it. You said a real dinky town, was it Stillwater? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, it was you'll quiet. never be allowed there again, David. <laughs> I just get kicked out of Stillwater. Yeah, <laughs> get down there, uh, and it was an outdoor show out in the stadium, out in the football stadium, and uh, it was just raining. And it would not quit, and then here comes the lightning, hitting the hitting the ring, and uh, so. Uh, Wahoo and superstar Billy Graham, they were the main event. They refused to go out, and uh, which nobody could. So uh, Wally Carbo was there that night for some reason. Anyway, they tell Wally that they're not going to wrestle in this shit. And Wally says, well, God, the place is sold out. You know, and it, it doesn't matter. We're not going to go out there in a fucking lightning storm. And sure enough, that thing was lightning till midnight. So anyway, uh, uh, they canceled the show. So the locker room was underneath the grandstand. And uh, I, I look at Bruce. So you want to be a wrestler, do you? <laughs> he says, holy shit. So I said, well, 540 miles back. <laughs> wow. So that's almost 1,100 miles. <laughs> that, well, that eliminated any desire for him to become a pro with it. Oh, and then a month later, after we had gotten our pay and stuff, he said, how much did you make? I said, they gave me a $50 bill, Bruce. <laughs> well, shit, the gas is more than that. <laughs> I said, yeah, and the beer and the... Vodka and the wine was more than that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was, uh, and then a couple other times, you know, I uh, he went to the garden with me, and uh, well, he came back quite a few times over that period of time. Came down to North Carolina. We had a snowstorm. We drive off the fucking highway. I said, "So you want to be a wrestler?" <laughs> but well, Kenny, uh, yeah, Kenny I, man we, we really appreciate the time I know we've taken up all your your bandwidth and all your using that one of those <laughs> words that, uh, that yeah. the kids use out your bandwidth and all your battery power so we apologize yeah. with that and we, but we really appreciate you coming on and man it's been a great great two hours whatever it's been hey, but, Thank you, Kenny. It's, it's such an honor to meet you and such an honor to talk to you. So thank you so much. Hey, uh, one, one, one last thing. Do you remember, you remember we made a trip from Savannah to Tampa and you, you threw my yeah. son Wes out, out of his bed and, 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 uh, in his bedroom one night. Yeah. I, I remember. Is that fish still underneath your dock? Yeah. Oh, that big ass bass. Yeah. I wait yeah. for uh, John partner, Ron Simmons to come down and catch it. I got a picture of the damn thing. It's, it's like, fist the mouth of was like this man you remember that so you could tell yeah. me i got big fish under my dark dog yeah i slept in your boy's uh water bed yeah <laughs> yeah my feet were hanging about a foot and a half over the uh <laughs> that was fun yeah. oh i remember that yeah great trip well we won't go into the details on that how much alcohol was consumed yeah. on that trip <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>